Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Talia Mae Betcher, <clears throat> pronouns she and her. <clears throat> I am in my mid fifties, a white trans woman. I'm wearing glasses. I have blonde hair. You can see some gray and the hair is longer than shoulder length. <clears throat> I'm wearing a, a gray sleeveless blouse and um, a loose and deliberately wrinkly, wrinkly white jacket like shirt over top. Um, my background is blurred out, but there is a brown sofa and a picture hanging up on the wall. Um, I'd also like to begin with a brief land acknowledgement. Cal State LA acknowledges the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of Tavangar, the Tongva world. We pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and our relatives' relations past, present, and emerging. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by thanking Dr. Shelley Tremaine for inviting me. I really feel it is an honor and a pleasure to be chairing this session in particular, uh, not only because I admire Dr. Tremaine's work very much, but I do, I do feel that there are some resonances um, in our work and some of, the, some of the issues that we are struggling with. Um, just a little bit about me. <clears throat> My, my work is mainly in trans philosophy, although when I started doing this, um, there was no such thing as trans philosophy. It's only recently that this has sort of appeared on the map. And some of you may know that it has sort of led to public controversies um, about what trans philosophy is, what it is to theorize trans people. Um, and so this is something that has become particularly important to me. I will just throw it out there that I see trans philosophy as a resistant philosophizing in response to trans oppression. And I, I think there are various sorts of what I like to call ground bound philosophy. I'll just, I wanna read this. Um, rather than closing its eyes to it, ground bound philosophy attends to the political work various philosophies perform, expressly incorporating that work as a topic of analysis where the ground bound philosophy self-consciously engages in its own political work, often in coalition with other philosophies in the service of resistance. And I, I had a chance to review Dr. Tremaine's, uh, not, not, not the full talk, but a, but a little um, intro to it. And her talk, Disaster Ableism, Academic Freedom and the Mystique of Bioethics, seems to be operating precisely in this mode. Um, so with that in mind, I would like to introduce Dr. Shelley Tremaine. Um, she holds a PhD in philosophy from York University, Canada. She's taught in Canada, the US and Australia and publishes on a range of topics, including feminist philosophy of disability, Michel Foucault, ableism in philosophy, social metaphysics and epistemology and biopolitics and bioethics from April, 2015 uh, Dr. Tremaine has coordinated, edited, and produced Dialogues on Disability, the groundbreaking and critically acclaimed series of interviews that she is conducting with disabled philosophers and posts to biopolitical philosophy on the third Wednesday of each month. Dr. Tremaine is the author of Foucault and Feminist Philosophy of Disability. Um, the manuscript was awarded uh, the 2016 Tobin Siebers Prize for Disability Studies and the Humanities. She is the editor of two editions of Foucault and the Government of Disability, and the editor of the Bloomsbury Guide to Philosophy of Disability that's forthcoming. Dr. Shelley Germain was also the 2016 recipient of the Tanisto Award for Disability Study and Culture in Canada, the Ed Roberts Postdoctoral Fellow at UC Berkeley and the World Institute on Disability in Oakland, California, and a principal investigator for Canada's National Policy Research Institute to promote the human rights of disabled people. Um, without further ado, um, I, I turn this now over to Dr. Shelley Chimay. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Talia. I'm very grateful for your presence at this conference and for your participation in this session. As Talia said, my name is Shelley Tremaine. My pronouns are she, they. I'm a white settler with short hair and I'm wearing large black glasses and long earrings. Behind me, there is light coming through a window. I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg 
covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and directly adjacent Haldeman Treaty territory. I offer my contributions to this conference with respect for and in solidarity with Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and other colonized settler states. My presentation today comprises a paper that I will read and slides that display some of the remarks that I read. The slides closely follow what I will say are quite plain with contrasting background and text and do not contain images. The last slide contains a, cap a brief captioned video. In this paper, I will draw upon both Kyle White's work on epistemologies of crisis and Naomi Klein's writing about disaster capitalism to elaborate my claim that bioethics is a neoliberal technology of government. White uses the term epistemologies of crisis to refer to colonialist narratives and ways of knowing that characterize certain situations and states of affairs as unprecedented and urgent while ignoring the history of colonization to do so. Klein has used the term disaster capitalism to describe elements of neoliberalism that variously produce, exploit, and aggravate economic, political, environmental, and social disasters and crises in ways that expand the reach of unregulated economic markets. My aim is to combine both White's insights about epistemologies of crisis and Klein's remarks about disaster capitalism with Michel Foucault's approach to inquiry in order to argue that bioethics is an instrument and mechanism of neoliberal eugenics. As an instrument and mechanism of neoliberalism, bioethics, I maintain, facilitates normalization of populations in ways that make them governable, manageable, and cost-effective. To motivate my argument, I introduce the term disaster ableism to refer to strategies and practices that produce, exploit, and aggravate perceived and actual economic, political, environmental, and social crises and disasters ways that advance eugenic goals. I want to begin this discussion of how the field of bioethics contributes to the production of disaster ableism by explaining my assumptions about the metaphysical status of disability and its constitution in philosophy, especially with respect to the arguments that I advanced in my book, Foucault and Feminist Philosophy of Disability. The arguments of the book are designed to identify the formative roles that various domains of philosophy play in the political, social, and material constitution of disability and its naturalized foundation impairment. The central thesis of the book is this. The conception of disability that currently predominates in philosophy, according to which disability is a naturally disadvantageous human attribute, personal characteristic, or property of subjects is inextricably entwined with the exclusion of disabled people from professional philosophy and the marginalization of critical philosophical work on disability from the discipline. Against the idea that disability is a natural human attribute, personal characteristic, or individuated property of certain people. I have argued that disability should be understood as an apparatus of power in Foucault's sense. That is, should be understood as an ensemble of discourses, institutions, scientific statements, laws, administrative measures, and so on. Directed at a perceived social requirement deemed urgent in a given historical moment. The apparatus of disability is, in other words, a historically specific and dispersed system of force relations that produces and configures practices 
towards certain strategic political ends, including the performative production of impairment as the prediscursive foundation of recognizably social disability. I maintain that in this historical moment, the urgent requirement to which the apparatus of disability responds is biopolitical normalization of populations and individual subjects. Claims according to which disability is a personal characteristic or property of individuals naturalize a culturally and historically specific phenomenon rendering disability an ahistorical and universal fact of the matter, rather than a contingent artifact of force relations. Alternatively, my argument that disability is an apparatus of power can address how certain states of affairs with respect to disability, states of affairs that bioethicists cast as personal misfortunes, rely upon performative claims about complexity, originality and urgency that typify what White describes as colonial presentism of epistemologies of crisis. In the fifth chapter of my book, chapter entitled Bioethics as the Technology of Government, I assert that bioethics has emerged as an institutionalized mechanism for resolution of the problem that disability poses for biopower and the neoliberal management of societies. I argue furthermore that the eugenic impetus of bioethics, an impetus according to which the appropriate responses to disability are prevention, correction, and elimination, contributes considerably to the hostile environment that disabled people confront in philosophy, reproducing our exclusion from the profession while reinforcing the marginalization of critical philosophical work on disability from the discipline. Bioethicists, many of whom are extremely protective of their lucrative subfield and its interests, have created a veritable mystique around the bioethics project. For example, most bioethicists continue to depict infamous medical and scientific abuses as disturbing relics of days gone by, that is, as disruptions in the history of an otherwise noble endeavor that strives to ensure that methodologies and practices in biomedicine and biomedical science uphold the highest ethical standards. Even the critiques of bioethics that bi feminist bioethicists and so-called disability bioethicists articulate implicitly and at, at times explicitly authorize the bioethics agenda by assuming the self understandings and self image that the subfield of bioethics represents. Hence, the direction and scope of these critiques are for the most part limited to arguments against a particular biomedical practice or the position of a particular bioethicist leaving the historical conditions of possibility for the overall enterprise of bioethics unexamined, unchallenged, and effectively intact. My antipathy with the field of subfield of bioethics constitutes a distinct departure from these other critiques of it. For my argument is that the subfield of bioethics, including feminist bioethics and disability bioethics, is a neoliberal technology of biopower whose increasing institutionalization and legitimation in the university, in the discipline of philosophy, and in public policy conceal the integral role that this field of inquiry plays in biopolitical strategies of normalization and the government of populations and individuals. In short, the field of bioethics is and has always been biopolitical, a premier arena for the adjudication of biopower's capacity to make live and let die, as Foucault put it. Indeed, as a technology of racism against the abnormal, use Foucault's insight, bioethics is a modern form of race science. 
Let me underscore that most philosophers regard bioethics as the appropriate domain in philosophy for considerations about disability as the continuing lack of job opportunities in philosophy of disability and the simultaneous proliferation of jobs in bioethics cognate fields indicate. In so-called Canada, for example, philosophers and bioethicists have played a fundamental role in the creation of a culture of eugenics within the discipline of philosophy itself and in the Canadian milieu at large with influencing development and promulgation of the ableist legislation that I will discuss momentarily, and ensuring that disabled specialists in philosophy of disability not enter the ranks of professional philosophy in Canada. Indeed, a growing number of bioethicists, both in Canada and abroad, dedicate considerable effort to the task of reconfiguring bioethics in ways that safeguard their own disciplinary, professional and institutional jurisdiction over philosophical claims about disability. I want to point out therefore that bioethics operates as an area of philosophy whose guiding assumptions and discursive practices are tremendous obstacles, both acknowledgement of the questions which the apparatus phrase of disability raises are genuinely philosophical and recognition that disabled philosophers who investigate these questions are credible philosophers and viable colleagues. But directly, philosopher, disabled philosophers of disability confront a wave of epistemic injustice and ridicule if they criticize bioethics too loudly and do so in ways that contest consolidation and status of the subfield itself. In short, bioethic, bioethicists act as gatekeepers for philosophy, shielding the profession from an influx of disabled people and guarding the discipline from the incursion of philosophy of disability. Of course, exceptions to this exclusion exemplified by practitioners of so-called disability bioethics are admissible and serve to disguise and legitimize the subfield of bioethics, typifying the polymorphic character of neoliberalism from which bioethics has emerged and enabling philosophy to proceed under the guise of political neutrality, objectivity, and disinterest. Indeed, the allegedly transformative area of inquiry called disability bioethics actually enhances mainstream bioethics, in which it appears to distinguish itself, sustaining the field of bioethics in general and enabling bioethics to enlarge its influence by refashioning itself in, in the practice of autocritique. In contrast, philosophy of disability is a categorically insurgent discourse which neither intersects with bioethics nor is derivative of it. That is, budding philosophers of disability should conceive their work as oppositional to bioethics and as a form of resistance to its eugenic impetus and medicalizing gaze, both of which phenomena increasingly implicate philosophy in the government of disabled people's lives while purportedly illuminating and informing their putatively self-actualizing choices. So far as bioethics is an instrument and mechanism of neoliberalism, which aims to normalize populations in ways that make them cost-effective and governable. Oops, sorry. Understanding of the operations of neoliberalism in a broader sense can help us identify and understand the power relations that animate bioethics facilitate the proliferation of its governmental strategies. If we wish to learn how the episteme of neoliberalism produces values, norms, and practices that capitalize on disasters and crises, we should look to the analysis that Klein develops in her landmark 2007 book, Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. 
the shock doctrine, Hines sets out to show how capitalism variously produces and exploits disasters and crises as a means to radically change economies and governments. For Klein, the wizard of this social movement was Chicago-style economist Milton Friedman. It was Friedman who wrote the instruction manual for the contemporary mobile global economy, an economy whose mobility steadily outstrips geopolitical borders, policies of deregulation, and a race to the bottom with respect to workers' wages and other benefits and protections. For example, as Klein explains, Friedman used Hurricane Katrina and the flooding of New Orleans in 2005 to facilitate the privatization of the city's public education system. Three months after the levees broke, Friedman published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal hailed the disaster as an occasion to usher in public policy that would further the interests of free market capitalism. As Friedman put it at the time, and I quote, most New Orleans schools are in ruins, as are the homes of the children who attended them. The children are now scattered all over the country. This is a tragedy. It is also an opportunity to radically reform the educational system. Quote. Friedman's radical idea was that the American government should distribute vouchers to families that they could in turn spend at state subsidized private institutions, charter schools as they are called, many of which are run for profit. Friedman emphasized that this elemental change in the way that education in the United States is financed should be regarded as a quote unquote permanent reform rather than a temporary measure. For Friedman, Klein explains, the idea that the state would run the school system reeked of socialism. In Friedman's right libertarian view, the sole functions of the state were in his words, and I quote, to protect our freedom both from the enemies outside our gates and from our fellow citizens to preserve law and order, to enforce contracts, to foster competitive markets, end quote. Less than two years after the levees were breached, privately run chartered schools had almost entirely replaced New Orleans public school system. Contract with the New Orleans Teachers Union had been effectively shredded and the union's 4,700 4, members had been fired. For Klein, this dismantling of the New Orleans public school system was Katrina, exemplifies disaster capitalism, which she defines as, and I quote, orchestrated raids on the public sphere in the wake of catastrophic events, combined with the treatment of disasters as exciting market opportunities, end quote. In this regard, Klein points to Friedman's influential essay, in which he articulated the core tenet of disaster capitalism thus, and I quote, only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That I believe is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, keep them alive and available, until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. This shock doctrine, as Klein refers to it, has been instrumental to the expansion of free market capitalism globally and the neoliberal shakedown of elected socialist governments throughout Central and South America, union busting in the United States, betrayal of solidarity in Poland, ideological pillaging of the African National Congress in South Africa, an installation the world over, autocracies and other fascist regimes sympathetic to unfettered capitalism. It is especially pertinent to the argument of my paper, Klein evocatively shows how disaster capitalism exploits disasters and crises, mold social values, norms, expectations, 
and explanations in ways that promote neoliberal social and political agendas amongst academics, media, NGOs, and populations at large, as well as the way it exploits these events in order to profoundly change governments and economies themselves. I contend that all levels of government in so-called Canada, as well as various academics, journalists, think tanks, corporations, and foundations have seized upon the COVID-19 pandemic as an, opportuni as an opportune occasion to engage in what I call disaster ableism, that is, have, have exploited the pandemic and the circumstances that surround it to cultivate and advance norms, values, and beliefs that promote ableist and eugenic agendas and goals. In particular, current liberal government and the bioethicists to whom Canadian politicians regularly defer and appeal employed disaster ableism to usher into law legislation, namely Bill C-7, that explicit, that significantly expands neo-eugenics in Canada. During a global pandemic, that is when the residents of Canada were losing their loved ones, their dwellings and their incomes due to COVID-19, living in situations of fear, disinformation and confusion, and were increasingly distracted and isolated Canadian federal government bypassed adequate public consultation, usurped international treaties, ignored the objections of Indigenous community leaders, manipulated par parliamentary procedure, procedure, and made a mockery of disabled experts invited to participate in its legislative proceedings on Bill C-7 in order to ensure passage of legislation that would make sweeping changes for existing Canadian laws on medically assisted suicide. In other words, the same neoliberal government, which throughout the pandemic has consistently failed to provide financial assistance and other social supports to disabled people, found a malevolent way to, in the words of Friedman, permanently reform distribution to disabled people, namely by providing them with easier access to premier premature death, rather than providing them with the means to live their lives. During the last months of 2020 and the first months of 2021, I wrote numerous blog posts at Biopolitical Philosophy to inform the blog's growing international readership about these events in Canada, and to explain the links between these events, disproportionate influence of bioethics in Canadian philosophy, the eugenic culture in Canadian philosophy that this way has produced. Early in 2021, furthermore, I can join these efforts with the efforts of other disabled academics, activists, and policy researchers across Canada. We were loud and persistent, determined to demonstrate how neoliberal arguments about personal autonomy and quality of life with respect to medically assisted suicide for disabled people and only disabled people, obscure and reinforce the apparatuses of disability, racism, colonialism, classism, and ableism that produced the arguments in the first place. Not surprisingly, my blog posts about Bill C-7 and medically assisted suicide made for short met with condescension and derision from bioethicists, especially from the editors of the International Journal of Feminist Approaches to Bioethics, who evidently think that bioethics journals should enjoy liberties not afforded to philosophy blogs. In a set of hostile interventions, that is, the journal's, editor, the journal's editors variously accused me of violating their academic freedom because in one blog post, I wrote that the journal had implicitly promoted made publishing an invited article on the topic authored by Jocelyn Downey, the most prominent proponent of medically assisted suicide in Canada. 
first three of the journal's editors, one of whom identifies as a disability bioethicist, badgered me on a Facebook post that I shared, repeatedly demanding that I remove the blog post or retract or retract the remarks that I made about the journal. Then after I implicitly refused to comply with these demands, one of the editors wrote a post on the blog's own journal, appealing to the fiction of neutrality that the journal allegedly upholds and again accusing me of failing to respect both the journal's publishing policy and academic freedom insofar as I refused to retract my indisputably publishable remarks. Finally, at least for now, the editors issued a call for expressions of interest for a special issue on academic freedom that linked to the biopolitical philosophy post in question. The call explicitly reprimanded me, accused me of attacking the journal and referred to my blog post as the motivation for the special issue. Rather tellingly, furthermore, the journal followed the example of the right-wing libertarian journal of controversial ideas by advising prospective authors that for the purposes of the issue on academic freedom, they would be permitted to publish their putatively transgressive ideas anonymously to avoid the sort of recrimination that I had displayed. Canadian bioethicists, law professors, politicians, and some very privileged white disabled people claimed that Bill C-7 promises greater equality for disabled people by further enshrining their rights to autonomy and self-determination. However, poor racialized indigenous trans and queer disabled people among others recognized that Bill C-7 constituted a threat to their collective existence in addition to the threats the legislation posed to their personal safety, sense of security, sense of belonging, and self-respect. While Canadian bioethicists, law professors, and politicians elicited pathos with significant, with, sorry, while Canadian bioethicists, law professors, and politicians elicited pathos with poignant speeches about disabled people who required immediate deliverance from the egregious suffering that their lives would impose if LC7 were not passed. Disabled activists, academics, and their allies pointed out that poverty, systemic ableism and racism, lack of affordable accessible housing, and settler colonialism are among the factors that constitute unlivable lives for disabled people in so-called Canada. Although Canadian bioethicist law professors and politicians tendentiously claim that Bill C-7 was a unique corrective to past legislative mistakes, and in addition, that arguments to the contrary amount to fallacious slippery slope reasoning, disabled people in Canada persistently argue that Bill C-7 was part of a long and treacherous Canadian history of eugenic policies and practices directed at disabled people and indigenous people amongst others. That the incremental normalization of the policies and practices depoliticizes and erases. Indeed, the arguments that Canadian bioethicists, law professors and politicians advance about Bill C-7 and medically assisted suicide in general are typical of the colonialist presentism uh, as white notes is a characteristic feature of the epistemologies of crisis. Recall that white uses the term epistemologies of crisis to refer to colonialist narratives and ways of knowing that characterize certain situations or states of affairs as unprecedented and urgent, ignoring histories of colonization and traditional teachings of Indigenous communities to do so. Historically, White notes, crises have often been used as both a justification for colonization and a tool with which to obfuscate it. As White explains, 
Sometimes perpetrators of colonialism imagine that their wrongful practices and actions are defensible because the practices and actions are responses to a given crisis, whether perceived or actual. That is, the, per per the perpetrators assume that suspension of certain concerns about justice and morality is justified in response to a crisis. To illustrate this assertion, White offers as an example, the way that Americans in the first half of the 20th century constructed dams that flooded the, the, can, that flooded the Seneca and Lakota peoples. The Americans engaged in these acts, White notes, because they believed that the United States needed energy and irrigation to lessen, lessen the threat of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. White is concerned to point out, however, that the belief according to which colonial oppression is, alleg is allegedly defensible due to crises is not a relic of the distant past, the distant past rather occurs now too. As White puts it, and I quote at length, today people perpetrate colonialism in the name of responding to env environmental crises, climate change being one prominent case. Responses to scientifically understand and mitigate climate change can harm or threaten in Indigenous peoples. From scientific reports that provincialize Indigenous knowledge systems to wind power projects that desecrate Indigenous lands, there's no reason to believe that colonialism today is something other than an evolved practice of a familiar form of power. By focusing on climate change in particular, and environmental destruction in general, White has elaborated the practices of knowing that enable an understanding of why crises are used to mask colonial power. Epistemologies of crisis, White writes, involve knowing the world such that a certain present is experienced as new. As White explains, and I quote at length again, a crisis epistemology in the context of settler colonialism might look something like this. A crisis is believed to be happening, whether real, genuine, or perceived. The crisis may be articulated as related to many problems, including health, economic well being, environmental sustainability, cultural integrity, and religious sal salvation. But what makes some state of affairs of the world crisis oriented is the automatic assumption of imminence. By imminence, I mean the sense that something horribly harmful or inequitable is impending or pressing on the present conditions people understand themselves to be living in. There is a complexity or originality to the imminent events, which suggests the need to immediately become solutions oriented in a way believed to differ from how solutions were designed and enacted previously. In other words, crisis epistemologies are presentist in their narrative orientation. A narrative is presentist, it explains, if it assumes a certain conception of the unfolding of time as means to the achievement of power or the protection of privilege. In particular, presentist orientations favor experiences of time that presume unprecedentedness and urgency. It is presentism is an exercise of colonial power that faces the historical realities and conditions of this colonial power. As White notes, indigenous study scholars have given considerable attention to the temporal assumptions on which settler colonial power relies critically exposing the liberal assumptions about the primacy of individual autonomy and the settler state that are embedded in national origin sto stories. In this regard, White refers to Audra Simpson, who noting that the settler colonial present is one of purported newness, writes that the settler colonial present is, and I quote, revealed is the fiction of the presumed neutrality of time itself, demonstrating the dominance of the present by some over others, 
the unequal power to define what matters, who matters, what paths are alive, and when they are, when they die, end quote. In this way, White points out, one becomes so preoccupied with the present crisis as new that one presents neither, that one questions neither one's own perspective nor the social origins from which the perspective may derive. In short, the sense of imminence that accompanies presentism leads people to obscure or minimize how their actions relate to the persistence of colonialism, capitalism, ableism, racism, and other forms of power. Drawing on White's insights, my argument is that the events, justifications, and rationale surrounding creation and passage of Bill C-7 have been framed within a presentist narrative. That is, by framing Bill C-7 as a unique and urgent new procedural corrective, Canadian bioethicists, law professors, journalists, and politicians have again reconfigured and obfuscated the incremental normalization of eugenic practices in precisely the way that White describes. According to the presentist orientation of an epistemology of crisis. In the context of Bill C-7 and of MADE in general, furthermore, this presentist orientation positions the notions of personal autonomy and quality of life as existing outside of any temporal location as timeless and universal, and in doing so, conceals the historically contingent and culturally specific character of these politically motivated ideals, as well as the way that these constructs emerged from and reproduce the liberal settler state itself. Indeed, both the incremental normalization of eugenic bioethical practices and the apparatus of disability from which the strategies of this mechanism derive have their origins in colonialism and the liberal settler state. There are many whites who are trying to solve the problem, but you never see them going under the label of liberals. That, that white person that you see calling himself a liberal is the most dangerous thing in the entire Western Hemisphere. He's the most deceitful. He's like a fox, and a fox is, almost, is always more dangerous in the forest than the wolf. You can see the wolf coming. You know what he's up to, but the fox will fool you. He comes at you with his mouth shaped in such a way that even though you see his teeth, you think he's smiling and taking for a friend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, so much to think about. Um, we're going to open things up um, for questions. I don't know if we can go a little bit over. We're, we're running a little bit short on time. I think we have about seven minutes, maybe we can go longer, but I'm going to. Um... Yeah, we, we can go a bit longer. We can, we can take an extra five, six minutes without. Okay, good. Sorry for, sorry for going a bit, a bit over my time, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's ironic at your own conference to run over time, but anyway, I, it's, yeah. it's forgivable. I, I have, um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, you know, I had a couple of, just things that occurred to me when, when you were speaking. Um, I mean, I think that there are sometimes, you know, um, clear analogies um, in, with disability philosophy and trans philosophy. And there's these choices that one makes in terms of, here's a conversation going on. And if I engage in this conversation, I'm buying into particular assumptions that are harmful. Therefore, should I even engage in this conversation? Um, or for example, you have, you have um, policies being developed that take up a medical discourse and that frame trans issues in a particular way. And so then you confront these questions, should I engage? My question to you is, um, it seems like you wouldn't allow for some cases of strategically deciding to weigh in, not because you believe in the discourse, but because you believe at that moment it could be strategically useful to do so. Um, what are your thoughts about that possibility? Um, so your question is about 
when should we intervene and when we shouldn't when should when we should I mean could it be could it be a could, could it be the case that on some occasions um, it may be useful or, or 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 strategic to actually speak in the language of the bioethicist to combat the bioethicist or because sometimes I find that it is useful to speak in different languages to try to accomplish different things, as long as you don't believe the hype, right? And as long as you make conscious choices about like, we're not, you, you worry about like, you know, supporting and edifying bioethics, but you might think that this particular intervention needs to be made in that language. And it seems to me that you wouldn't allow for that as a possibility. Um. Well, I should say that um, I, uh, um, I'm thinking of how I want to address this. First of all, um, I think that um, I think that um, many theorists of disability um, have been doing that for years, speaking in the language of bioethics. And um, I don't think that it, it's I don't think that it's had the outcomes or the results that um, they either think it's had or um, they wanted it to have. And um, so I think that, um, I think that there comes a point when, when you, you um, I think that there came a point where I, when I felt that I realized that, um, that, um, uh, you know, the, and um, my thinking has, is very much, um, influenced by Foucault's thinking about neoliberalism and how, um, how neoliberalism, um, uh, I guess you could say co-ops or um, refashions itself to uh, incorporate critique um, and um, refigures itself. And, and that's what I think that um, um, talking in the language of bioethics uh, ends up doing. Um, and I, you know, I think it's it's the difference between um, you know it's the difference between taking a, re a reformist uh, approach to um, uh, bioethics as opposed to taking a revolutionary or insurgent um, approach to it. And um, I, I think that um, I, I hope that more uh, philosophers of disability will see that um, you know we need to take a revolutionary approach because. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, you know, the danger of being co-opted is, is very real and um, it's not something that it's going to be um, avoided. This has life consequences, I would add, right? This is the gist of your, what you're saying in this talk. Yeah. Um, Jonathan has a question. Thank you, Shelley. Thanks, Shelley. A very, very powerful talk. I, I'm not sure what to make of it when you're also criticizing people I respect. So I, I need to go back and ponder that. But um, I, I just want to take up the what I took you to be saying early on in the talk about um, bioethics policing philosophy to exclude disabled philosophers from philosophy. Um, because I, that surprised me a lot because I, in my experience, bioethicists and bioethics just doesn't have that level of power within philosophy. And if you look at the people who are doing bioethics, relatively few of them are even in philosophy departments. So very often they're in law departments or in medical ethics departments or special centers. For example, in Oxford, uh, there are a number of centers that do bioethics and, and people are associate members of the philosophy departments. But um, yeah, I don't want to talk about any university in particular, but very often philosophers rather look down their noses at bioethicists. So it surprises me that you, you think they have actually any institutional power and that you know, many people who work on these topics in philosophy probably are not even referring or reading the work of some of the bioethicists. So I, yeah, I'd welcome your thoughts on that. Okay, well, first of all, I think um, it's interesting that you would think that bioethicists at Oxford are not in philosophy departments and the ones that are, you know, don't, they don't have power because, I mean, um, you know, two of the most powerful um, bioethicists with respect to 
um, you know, uh, what it, um, well, in a number of areas, especially with, you know, the claims that they make about disability would be Jeff McMahon and Sevalescu, Julian Sevalescu, and they're both in the yeah. philosophy department at yeah. Oxford. Well, well they're so, very different, actually. So, so you're right that Jeff McMahon was appointed to a chair of philosophy in the philosophy department. That is true. Uh, but, but Julian was not appointed in the philosophy department. He was appointed to a special chair that was set up in bioethics. So that was a point okay. I'm making. That, that, that there are a lot of special groupings outside the philosophy department. Even if they're members of the philosophy department, they don't necessarily come in far a normal route. They're, they're already in uh, a different position. But Jeff McMahon, you're right, is a- Okay, okay. That, um, um, I. I think that um, if you look at other um, other departments or other countries, and it's important that um, uh, I re remind everyone that I'm uh, much of my papers is addressing the position of bioethics in Canada, okay. and certainly in Canada. Um, and I've said this in a number of different contexts on you know uh, in in papers in in the fifth chapter of my book. Um, and on the blog, et cetera, um, that in Canada, um, bioethics really shapes philosophy. It has shaped philosophy in terms of who gets the jobs, um, what kind of jobs they get, and uh, you know what, what kind of philosophy gets done in Canada. Um, that's, you know, that's pretty unquestionable, um, I think. Um, so, um, but I do think that, um, and I do think that is that this is very much tied to um, funding and who gets the money. Bioethicists get a lot of money for their projects, and uh, we know how um, how much um, universities are the engines of universities are um, who brings in the money. Yeah, well, that that is true, but that still doesn't mean the police who gets jobs in philosophy departments. Yes. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I wanna, I wanna, I'm sorry to intervene, and this is like, you know, um, a great conversation, but I want to make sure we get at least one or two more questions in as, as we run out of time. And so um, this is a question from um, Melinda, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. Uh, I appreciate so much the language of disaster ableism. It seems to me that there is a tight connection between some moves made in environmentalist philosophy and bioethics on this point. Is there a sense in which climate change is also a crisis that invites the tightening of neo-eugenics, do you think? One more thing, I do think there is a connection between my risk collectivization project and your project on disaster ableism, chances for interruptions, but also serious tightening of eugenics um okay um yes I, melinda i think that there are lots of connections between my work and yours um with respect to risk with um with respect to disaster etc um i'm sorry the i think the first part of the question was about uh, climate change mm -hmm. Um, and um, I just want to, um, I, I, I talk about, I talked about um, in um, paper, I talked about um, Kyle White's work um, and I, but I didn't give the uh, title of the, of the paper and I do, I want to do that now. Um, so he, the title of this paper is a, Against Crisis Epistemology and uh, it's a chapter in the collection, uh, the Rutledge Handbook of Indigenous Critical Studies. Um, and he also, um, with um, he's also written a paper. Um, he wrote a paper and uh, uh, allowed me to put it on the blog as opposed. And it's about the um, the notion of unprecedentedness and climate change. And he, you know, uh, wants to point out that you know um, what seems like uh, unprecedentedness to um, non-indigenous populations. Um, uh, may not be seen the same or perceived the same way by indigenous populations who, uh, you know, may see that for the last 100 to 200 years, they've been living in a dystopian future. So it's not that future is unprecedented because for them, uh, they've already been living in dystopia. But I do think that um, that disaster ableism um, uh, 
and, and climate change. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in that in that area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelley. I don't believe there are any more questions, um, but I know we're all grateful for this um, rich and provocative conversation that I expect to go on further.